verse 13, the word of God says this, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Amen. Our dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you and we thank you. Lord, I pray that you would be glorified and honored this morning, Lord God, that you would bless our efforts as we worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. Lord, I pray that you'd be with our worship service, Heavenly Father, that there would be a joyful noise into your ears, Lord, that it would be pleasing to you. Lord, I pray that you'd be with Brother Brad as he comes this morning, Lord, and delivers the message that you've laid on his heart. Lord, I pray that he'd uh, speak and preach in spirit and in truth this morning, Lord God, that your work would land on fervent hearts and minds, that we would be receptive to it, Heavenly Father. Lord, and we do take this time, Lord, this Memorial Day to remember the sacrifices that many men and women gave, Heavenly Father. They gave their all. They gave their life to serve this great country. Lord, we pray for them and their families. Lord, that you would just bless them for their sacrifices, Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for our armed forces, Lord, every branch. Lord, we pray for those who are on active duty now, Lord, those who are on reserve, Lord, that may be called up at any moment. Lord, we just ask that your protective hands would be upon them. And Lord God, as we uh, pay a special tribute to, to them, Lord, most importantly, that we remember your sacrifice, Lord, that you gave your life for the world, Lord, that all who love you would, would not perish, Lord God, but have eternal life. And that's my prayer this morning, Lord, that's our prayer, that if there's one here under the sound of our voice, Lord, that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation for that person or those people. And Lord, we just pray that whatever happens, you receive all the glory, honor, and praise for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray and ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Amen.
stepfather he fell getting out of the car the other day and broke some ribs uh, so let's remember him uh, good to see Miss Betty back with us today she's not been feeling well but she's having a better day today so Miss Betty good to see you today uh, Julia Murphy's dad that we had on the prayer list passed away this week and uh, the service time is June the 6th but we don't have a place yet so I'm not sure which funeral home he'll be at uh, as soon as we find that information out, we'll be sure that the church know. So just keep that in your prayers. I uh, visited with Miss Jean Lidiker this week, and Jean has got to go back and see her doctor one day this week, and she does have uh, some surgery to have done, uh, and they're waiting on her to get a little bit stronger before they do that surgery. Uh, plus, she takes some blood thinner medicine, so they've got to get all of that worked out. So just be in prayer for Miss Jean. Uh, and she's facing that. I uh, want to continue to remember Diane Stanberry in her prayer. She's in hospice care. Uh, also, my brother, uh, Mike, uh, has got his day to meet with the surgeons in uh, Houston on June 4th. Uh, he'll be there for about two to three days doing tests. Uh, I'm not sure if they'll do the surgery then, if they'll just get all the tests run, and then there'll be another day. So let's remember him in our prayers. Any others that we need to remember this morning? Okay, any unspoken requests today? Okay, well, let's remember these as we pray together. 
Let's stand as we pray together today. This is Memorial Day weekend, and I know that uh, you know if you've got uh, family and friends that uh, died serving our country, that uh, sometimes this will be a tough weekend for families. So certainly want to remember uh, them this morning, and also remember those who gave their all that we can enjoy what we do here today and have the freedom to enjoy to do it. Uh, it's not ever place around the globe that has the freedom that we have today. A lot of people are meeting for worship in secret, uh, behind closed doors, and uh, if they get caught, they'll get locked up. Uh, we don't have that fear here today, and we've got men and women to thank for that. So let's be thankful in our hearts. Let's pray. Father, we do come to you today just uh, grateful, <coughs> Father, to you for the country that we have. And Father, as we look back on the history of this nation, we have to believe that your hand was instrumental in this country being put together in the way that it was. And yet, Lord, we, we understand and we realize this morning that uh, even for a country like ours, uh, that there still has to be people who are willing to fight and give it all to preserve what we have. And so, Lord, today we're thankful for those men who <coughs> uh, gave their lives and paid the ultimate sacrifice that we might have the freedoms to, to live as we choose here in this country, especially to have the freedom to worship you. And uh, Father, we're grateful for that freedom that we enjoy today. And uh, as we pray together today, Father, we're mindful of these that we've mentioned on our prayer to this, praying uh, you might move to meet their needs. Father, all the unspoken requests that we have this morning, uh, we believe that we serve the great physician who's knows us more than we know ourselves, who's able to do more and above what we can think or could imagine. So Father, we, we bring these petitions before you today asking you to meet the needs that they have, to be with their families, to stand by them, and uh, Father, to give them the assurance and the confidence, Lord, that no matter what happens, uh, that you have our best interest in, in, in mind. And Father, that uh, no matter what does happen, uh, that this world's not our home, but our eternal home is in heaven. And Lord, that's where we long to be, where we'll be in your presence. And uh, Father, if, if you choose uh, not to heal us, and these that we've spoken and mentioned this morning, then we understand that if they're in your family, they're, they're going to a better place. So we give you praise and thanks for that this morning. And even we ourselves look forward to that day when we will see you be with you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the time that we have to come together and to worship you. We pray your blessings will be upon it. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Many, 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 many years ago, y'all can sit down for me. I had a young boy come to work for me. He was needing to make a little extra spending money for the summer. And uh, his name was Brad Flurry, and uh, probably the meanest boss that he ever had, uh, but uh, he worked for me that summer, and we got lots done, and he learned a lot about the electrical business, some he already knew, uh, but it was uh, my privilege to have him work for me that summer, and uh, today, uh, it is our privilege to have him as our special guest, and so uh, today we have with us Commanding Officer Major Brad Flurry. And uh, Brad has served in our military. He's been uh, right out there on the very front edge of things, so he knows uh, what it's like uh, to be in danger, to be in battle. Uh, he knows what it's like to lose friends. And uh, so today, we not only will he be bringing our message this morning, but he's going to come and speak to us about the importance of observing uh, Memorial Day. So Brad, you come. It's good to have you this morning. God bless you. Exactly. We'll talk a, a little while later about the summer that I had the privilege of working with Gary. When Gary asked that I share a few words, not only later during the sermon, but today about Memorial Day, is, uh, it got me thinking that I'm thankful that we live in a country that supports and celebrates its military. Amen. That across the country today, in churches big and small, as people are pausing to, to give thanks. 
and our government really has three holidays for our service members. You may not know this, but Armed Forces Day is also in May, and it's a day to thank those that are currently serving. Then we have Veterans Day in November to thank those who are alive, served at one time. And then tomorrow, most of us know what that is, it's Memorial Day. Amen. It's an opportunity to remember the troops that have given everything in service to their country. And as I was thinking about what to share is I believe in the power of story. I just want to share something with you for a moment, a, a true story from the time that when I was in Iraq. And part of it revolves around what I call the, the myth of Memorial Day. You see, this myth is known by everybody in this room that served. And it's simply that when someone gives their life, that they're given their life for their country. That's sort of true. But if you ask any Marine, soldier, sailor, airman that have been there next to someone who've lost their life, is they'll tell you that that person lost their life, not necessarily for their country, but for their brother standing next to them. A few years ago, I had the privilege of hearing General John Kelly, a man who also lost his own son in combat in Iraq, tell a story of these two Marines. Two Marines from two completely different worlds, and had they not been Marines, they probably would have never met each other. But they are Marines. They are combat Marines. Forged in the crucible of Marine training and in combat. And because of this, they were brothers. They were brothers even closer than if they'd been born of the same mom. And on this day, they were in a city called Ramadi, standing watch together with a group of newly trained Iraqi soldiers and policemen. And they were protecting the front gate of an area that housed about 50 Marines and about 100 Iraqi police. Unfortunately, this day, a large blue truck turned the corner, sped up, and headed down the alleyway past the, the serpentine obstacles that they had in place. It stopped just short of their outpost, and it detonated, killing them both instantly. During the investigation, as they found, there were some security cameras that they had as part of their security measures, and they were able to capture six seconds of video. The recording shows that as the vehicle made its way down, that a lot of the Iraqi police took off, like a lot of rational men may do, and ran the other way. But the recordings showed that these two Marines stood their post, Amen. firing their weapons nonstop as their bullets hit the front windshield of the truck. The two Marines, they never stepped back. They never stepped to the side. Their feet were shoulder width apart as they were trained to do. And they continued to fire, causing the death of the driver, which stopped the truck prematurely. The truck explodes. The cameras go blank. And two Marines go see their God. Amen. Now, six seconds are not long enough for them to think about their country, about mom, dad, apple pie. Nope. But six seconds was long enough for these men to know that they've got to protect their brothers behind them. You know, we read a verse earlier in service, and Jesus spoke about it in the Gospel of John. He said that no greater love than this, than one would lay down his life for his friends. So tomorrow is uh, Memorial Day, a day that we have set aside to remember. And really, I think it's important for us to remember three things. And first is this. With freedom comes great opportunity. So we should be mindful. With freedom comes great responsibility, so we should be wise. With freedom comes great sacrifice. We should be grateful. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, as the other prayers also have been echoed, we just thank you for this country, for the freedom that we enjoy, <coughs> the opportunities that we have, for the security of our land. God, we thank you for those who have served in their armed forces, risking their lives for our liberty and safety and security. God, thank you for those who have given their lives in service to our country, sacrificing in such a costly way for the sake of others. God, thank you for a day set apart, not just for celebration and barbecues, but for remembrance of these sacrifices. 
God, so today we pray for these families and their friends as they mourn. Heavenly Father, would you just reassure them that the sacrifice of their loved ones contributes to a worthy cause, the cause of freedom. May they be proud of those who have lost their life. And Lord, even as we remember those who have given their lives in the past, those we may know, could you protect those that still stand in the front lines today? Encourage them, bring them home safely to their family and their friends. And God, your word reminds us that there's no greater expression of love than sacrificial love. So we rightly honor those who sacrifice themselves for their friends and their country, but Lord, let us also remember our God who sacrificed his own son for us, so that all who believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Amen.
Lord Jesus, hear our prayers, spoken and unspoken. We're here to bless this giving, this offering that we give. So we do your work. I echo the words of, that have been said today. Bless all those in the service of our country who wear a uniform. Especially bless those families that support those folks that are in uniform and have to deal with the sacrifices that are made. The Lord bless those in most need of our mercy. Take care of the folks that are on our prayer list. In your blessed name we pray. Amen.
flag and attach a silver star while the grieving mother leans against his arm and he stands before the family and does his best to tell how he survived the night his best friend read Executive Pastor of Ministry at uh, Kingsland Baptist Church in Katy, Texas. And uh, he, we were talking a little bit before church this morning. And uh, on an average Sunday, they'll have somewhere around 3,200 people, so just a small church. <laughs> and uh, he told me they were getting ready for vacation Bible school where they'll have over 2,000 kids come to vacation Bible school. Uh, so he's a busy man. And uh, Brad, so good to have you today. You come and preach the word for us today. Gary's right. I do have a lot of family here. My oldest son, Hunter, is, we came in the door, I asked my wife, he said, are we related to everybody here? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, probably. Uh, that, may, that may be the case, but, but that's all right. Is, well, good morning, Parkview Baptist Church. Good morning. Good morning. Man, it is, it's, first of all, as Gary mentioned, uh, I had the privilege of working with him a long time ago. But more importantly than that is I'm truly thankful for this opportunity. As Gary, I know as a pastor, the work that you put in each week to deliver God's word to your congregation. And so I truly thank you for this opportunity. I know there's a lot of trust in that. So thank you. Church, a little bit about your pastor is he mentioned I worked for him during that ninth grade summer, but what I learned the most from that summer had nothing to do with pulling wire through houses as an electrician. Is that summer, uh, the young lady that I was dating, is her grandfather passed away. And so her family had called and said, hey, do you mind going to the funeral with us? And so I asked my boss, and he said, yes. And he said, do you need anything? And I said, well, I don't, I don't have a tie. I think I'm supposed to wear a tie to a funeral. And the next morning, I'm getting up, and I'm getting ready to go to the funeral, and Gary, on his way to work, pulls in my driveway. 
Not only does he hand me a tie, he puts it on my neck and shows me how to tie it. Church, that's the kind of pastor you have. So Gary, thank you for that opportunity. I have to tell you that it, it feels strange standing on this stage. You know, I probably as I grew up here stood on this stage quite a bit, but really two memories are etched into my mind. First is when I was seven years old as I stood on this stage as part of a children's musical choir led by Basil and Cheryl Sims. Then many decades later I stood here as I gave the remarks during my grandfather's deacon ordination. Amen. Both of those memories mean a lot to me. You see, I grew up in this church. This is a church where I was saved. At eight years old, Brother Keith Wolf, who was our student pastor, minister, did everything with children, led me to Christ. I was baptized right there. To this day, I've yet to meet a, a minister of the gospel that's bigger than Keith. Right? If you don't know Keith, that's a big man, right? People say, why did you come to the Lord? I'm like, Keith told me to. So, <laughs> great, great man. I have memories of his mom, Shirley, standing there and playing the piano each week. His dad, Dalton, with a loud, booming voice, saying the world's longest prayers as he continually echoed the words, Our Heavenly Father, over and over. I have memories of eating snow cones during BBS and getting in trouble as Corey Johnson and I ran through the fellowship hall. I have memories of walking through those doors and each Sunday, Jack Warner teaching me how to correctly shake a man's hand. I have memories of my grandmother's Sunday school class as I would walk by and watch these ladies open God's word and pray together. I have memories of my grandfather and his daughters, my mom and my aunts, on this stage singing the special music. See, I have memories of the people. So for me, as I was praying about this message, I asked Gary, what do you want me to, to preach about? He said, that's between you and the Holy Spirit. I said, okay. So really, I began to ponder a question, is, is how did I go from a boy sitting in the pew, and then back in the days, we got a sign seating, and ours was right there, right? You know how it is in Baptist life, right? You have a sign seating, ours was over there. How did I go from a boy sitting in the pew receiving the message to a man called by God to deliver the message? It's been quite a journey. I think for all of us, life is a journey. We understand that, and... Quite often as we ask ourselves, how do I know I'm making the right decision? Typically for me, the way I ask that question is, God, what is your will for my life? God, what do you want me to do? So today I want to look at that question. But before we do, is I really want to share two things with you. Is number one, church, is I believe there's a God. Amen. And that regardless of my circumstances, for better or for worse, that God is good. And that he has created everything, including you and me, with a purpose. Amen. So that means a good God has a good plan for your life. Amen. So I want to start today by just really reading a scripture passage over you. This is not going to be our key text today, but it's going to sort of set the tone for today's message. And it's something you're probably very familiar with. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. God says this. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. There's a good God with a good plan for your life. As we open God's word, will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, today as we look at your will for our life, as we seek your face, our prayer is that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be pleasing to you. Yes. Amen. Amen. So the number one question that I've asked myself in 41 <laughs> years on this earth is, God, what do you want me to do? God, what do you want me to do about fill in the blank? I remember the first time that I truly asked God this question. I was a junior. I left in high school. And I remember looking at my future and my circumstances, and I realized, you know what? It's probably better if I leave Lufkin. My family didn't really have the resources for college, and I didn't want to continue to work at CC's Pizza my whole life, or Eckerd's Drugstore. So I realized that the military may give me a path to a better future. Amen. So I asked God. I said, God, do you want me to join the Marines? Do you want me to join the military? And 
I didn't really get an answer. There was no burning bush like Moses got. There was no visit by an angel like Mary got. There was no vivid dream like Joseph got. And so I was a little confused, and I think maybe a lot of times for us is there confusion about God's will for our life. So for a few moments today, as I want us to look at the life of Abraham, and before we examine the life of this faithful man, is, is I want to sort of set the stage and make sure we understand really the three aspects of God's will, so we know exactly what we're asking for and what we're looking for. My wife Liz and I have been married, July will be 20 years 20 years of marriage, and over the years, I've done a lot of shopping with her and for her. So I've had to learn the difference between flip-flops and sandals. Did you know there's a difference? Between a t-shirt and a blouse. Between jeans and slacks. I just call all of them pants, right? But there's a difference, and it's important for me to know those, because if I'm going to go shopping with her or for her, I need to know specifically what I need to ask for. So when we look at God's will, I'm going to make sure that we have at least an understanding of what we're talking about. Now, theologians will debate the different names for this, and today I'm going to sort of just keep it simple for you, but three areas. And the first part is the providential will of God. The providential will of God. This is simply what God has ordained to happen before time. The creation of the world. His plan of salvation on the cross. The defeat of death by the resurrection. The second coming. This is the upper story. This is the providential will of God. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he said, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy what? Will, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The providential will of God. That's the upper room, the big story. Next is the revealed will of God. It's called the revealed will of God because it's revealed to us in His Word. These are the Ten Commandments, all the do's and don'ts you find in Scripture, the teachings of Jesus, the blessings and the wisdom we learn from the saints of the Old Testament, the apostles, the disciples, the prophets. All of this here is revealed to us. But the problem with knowing the revealed will of God is quite often is we don't know the Word of God. So for us to know the revealed will of God, we must know the Word of God. Amen. Next is the personal will of God. And this is typically the one that we care about the most. And it answers the question, God, what do you want me to do in a certain situation? For example, I've got friends now that are between jobs. They were laid off in the oil and gas industry, and so now they're trying to determine what path they take next. They can't look here and say, okay, I should work now for BP instead of Exxon. I'm not going to be able to find that. I've got friends that their kids are praying through what, where to go to college next. Tanner and I were talking last night. He's going to be a senior next year in high school. What is he going to do next? He can't look here and he's going to say, I want you to do exactly this. Go to Sam Houston State instead of SFA. Go to A&M instead of you. You're not going to find that. What about for me? Over a decade ago, and I felt God calling me into the ministry, there's not a book here, at least not in my table of contents, that says First Brad, that can list everything that I should do at the appropriate time in my life. But I want you to know this, is that God's personal will for your life is directly tied to his revealed will and his providential will. Amen. So what does that mean? God is never going to will something for you that stands in contrast to his word. God's never going to say, it's my will for you to move in with your boyfriend and girlfriend before marriage. God's will is never going to say, you should sacrifice your kid and your relationship with them because you want a social life. He's never going to say, it's my will for you to go into debt to support a lifestyle your paycheck doesn't support. God's will doesn't say those things. So today what I want us to do is to look at the life of Abraham. So if you have your Bible, will you... Turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. So who is Abraham? Abraham really is the father of the Jewish faith. In fact, every Jew and every Muslim can trace their family heritage all the way back to Abraham. In the Old Testament, 
They loved Abraham and respected him and revered him so much. When they spoke about God, is they said, this is God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so today I want to look at his life, because I think if we can look at Abraham's life and understand how God revealed himself to Abraham, maybe we can understand God's will for our life. So Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1, the word of God says this, The Lord said to Abram, Go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I'll show you. Now we're going to keep reading, but I'm going to pause right here because it's important for you to understand what God is asking them to do. God is saying, I want you to get up, I want you to leave your house, your family, your land, your inheritance, and I want you to leave. But God doesn't say where he wants them to go. He says, I'll show you. During my time in the Marine Corps, Liz and I and our boys, we moved over a dozen times. We're constantly moving. But each time, I would get detailed orders that would tell me where to go, when to be there, how much time I had to get there, because for all of us, we like to know those details, right? We like to know those. But a lot of times, God doesn't simply provide that. He just told Abraham to leave. You'll notice in the next few verses as he talks about some promises. And now I want to pick up in verse 4. It says this. So Abram went as the Lord told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Verse 5. He took his wife, his nephew, and all the possessions they had acquired in Haran and set out for the land of Canaan. When they came to Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the site of Shechem in the oak of Marah. At the time the Canaanites were in the land, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. Verse 8. From there he moved on to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, he built an altar to the Lord there and he called on the name of the Lord. Then Abraham journeyed by stages to the Negev. You know that when God tells you to do something, it's never by accident? Amen. When God told Abraham to leave, he knew exactly where he wanted Abraham to go. Now, wouldn't it have been easier for Abraham if God would have just gave him clear directions? It would have probably saved Abraham a lot of time, a lot of effort, probably a lot of pain and suffering if God would have just said, Abraham, listen, I know you're 75 years old, and you've got a lot of stuff. So here's what I want you to do is just meet me in Negev in about four months. Does that sound good? And I'll meet you there. But that's not what God did. But that's typically how we want God to respond to us. We want the details. We want the timeline. We want to be able to map it all out. So if God doesn't do that for us, how can we know his will? Today, the time we have together is I want to really give you three principles that have helped me understand God's will, and we can see it's also how God has revealed himself to Abraham. The first one is this. It's not the destination, it's the journey. Amen. It's not the destination, it's the journey. It's not the location to where you're going, it's not the car, it's not the school, it's not the job, it's the journey with him. And when you go back to the end of verse 5, it says this. When they came to Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the site of Shechem at the Oak of Marah at the time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. I want you to notice this, church. God is revealing his will to Abraham as they are walking together. You see that? God is there in the midst of the journey with him. There's a deep connection between walking in faith and faithfulness with God and him revealing his plan to us. This summer at my church, is we're walking through the book of Proverbs for the summer. One of my favorite Proverbs is <laughs> chapter 3, verse 5 through 6. And many of you know this. And it simply says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. I love this because it says, God will make our paths straight. Well, for our paths to be straight is we have to have a direction. Thankfully, the Bible tells us what we need to do to find that direction in that same passage. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Amen. You see, the goal for us as we walk with God is that we journey with him. And it's important for us to know that God is more interested in how you are growing than where you are going. 
He's more interested in how you are growing than where you are going. But we don't like that. We like to know the plan. When I retired from the Marine Corps, I try to stay physically active and I try to stay in shape, mainly to keep up with my two boys. So for, I, I tend to work out a few times a week with a lot of guys that I go to church with. And what's interesting is when I text him and say, hey, be at my house either early in the morning or late in the afternoon, and here's exactly what we're going to do, is a lot of them show up. When I say, just be at my house at 5.30 a.m., and I don't tell them what we're going to do, not as many come. Why? We like to know the plan. We like to know how it's going to work out. But God doesn't do that. Because what he does is something even better. Amen. He gives us a promise. Go back to verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, Go out from your land, your relatives, your father's house, to the land that I will show you. Did you see that? He tells Abraham, what? I will show you. You know what that means? It's he's going on the journey with you. Amen. When my kids were little, was they loved to play with Legos. Quite often, they would say, Dad, come, come play Legos with me. I could have easily said, boys, you're, you've got the Lego box. It's got the instructions. It's got all the details you need. Go do it on your own. But there's more joy. There's more fulfillment. When we do it together. That's what God is saying. Let me show you. Follow me. Discovering God's will always involves walking with God. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Amen. The second part. God's will for your life is not hidden. Do you know that? God's will for your life is not hidden. Over the years, I've heard some strange but true stories of people trying to figure out what God wants them to do. I've heard people that say, you know what, I'm going to just take the word of God, and I'm going to open it up, and I'm going to point to a verse, and that's what I'm going to do, right? So can you imagine if you're the guy that wakes up and says, here's the deal. It's God, I'm just going to open this Bible, I'm going to put my finger down, and here's what you want me to do today. Boom. And I land in James, and it says, be miserable and mourn and weep. That's a horrible day. Do you think that's God's will for your life? Or you've got the man that says, you know what, God, today is my wife's birthday, and I want to write her a blessing. Tell me what I should say. And I randomly open the Bible and throw my finger down, and it says, the Lord says, you have become old and advanced in age. <laughs> should I tell that to my wife? No. But I've known people that try to do this as if God's will is hidden, Right? Or sometimes we, we try to look in the Bible and find miracles that we can shape to fit our circumstances. As someone once told me that if I find a penny on the ground today, then I know God wants me to do this. <sighs> Friends, God's will for your life is not hidden. He wants to lead you way more than you want to be led. In John chapter 15, verse 15, as Jesus says this, I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I call you friends because I've made known to you everything I have heard from my father. Does it sound like he's hiding anything from you? He says what? I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. Later, actually before that, when Jesus is talking about how he's the good shepherd, in chapter 10, verse 27, as Jesus says, you are my sheep and my sheep hear my voice. You have the opportunity and the ability to hear what God has for your life. Amen. These passages remind us that as sons and daughters of God, that you have the ability to hear his voice. So what does this look like when it comes to God's will for your life? Is typically when someone comes to my office and a lot of young men that I mentor and counsel, they'll, they'll come in and they'll say, should I marry this girl? Is this God's will for my life? Okay. Well, let's look at God's revealed will. What does the Bible say? The Bible says that marriage is good. It says that it's good and honorable to find a good wife. So I ask the question, does she love Jesus? Does she seek him? Does she seek after him and spend time in his word? Does she love you? Do you love her? Well, guess what? You probably don't need to overthink this. God's will is yes for you to get married, but more importantly is for you to be a servant husband that sacrifices for your wife. That's God's will. Amen. For your marriage to glorify him, that's God's will. For my friends to say, you know what, should I, should I take this job? What does your job ask you to do anything against the word of God? 
Well, if not, then God's will is probably for you to provide for your family and for you to honor him in the workplace. You know that? I work a lot with, with our students as well. And they get the question, well, what college should I go to? Well, when I meet with families, it's quite often that I will tell them, is typically this needs to be a financial decision for your family. And after they've made that decision, is I'll tell the student, more importantly, I encourage you in the towns that you're looking at for a college, that you look for a gospel-centered, Bible-believing, Christ-preaching church. Amen. And then you know what God's will is? For you to stay rooted in His Word, connected to a church, and to do your homework. Amen. That's what God's will is. We don't have to overthink this. Because if you see the pattern here, God's will revolves around obedience. You see that? Amen. Obedience, what he's called you to do. When God speaks to Abraham and tells him to leave his home, I want you to listen to what Abraham's response is. You want to know why? Because it's hard to hear. Because Abraham doesn't say a thing. He just obeys. Throughout the entire story of leaving his land, we don't hear Abraham say anything. God says, go. Abraham goes. When our kids were little, Liz taught the boys a phrase. They would say, I will obey right away. I will obey right away. That's a biblical principle. Quite often, we hear inspirational stories of people who obeyed God and made major shifts in their life. Maybe they went to the mission field or they went into the ministry. Or we read scripture and, and we see our biblical heroes. But what I love about the beginning story of Abraham is the simple steps of faith. Each morning he got up and he continued his journey. Each morning he got up and he led his family. Each morning he got up and he did what God had called him to do. James chapter 1, verse 22 says, But be doers of the word and not just hearers, deceiving only yourself. You see, Abraham was not just a hearer of God's word. He was obedient to what God had called him to do. Amen. Abraham had faith that God would do exactly what God said he would do. And more importantly is Abraham, he believed that God's plan for his life was better than anything that Abraham could do on his own. Now, friends, I know there are many things that, that we don't and we can't know about God's will, but there are a lot of things that we can know. We can know that it's God's will for you to be with him in prayer, to abide with him in his word, to flee from sin, to love your neighbor as yourself. We don't have to sit back and wait for these things to happen. God's will for our life is clear. Number one, it's not the destination, it's the journey. And number two, his will for you is not hidden. Number three, and most importantly, God's personal will for your life demands a personal relationship with him. More important than all of these decisions is a personal relationship for you with your God. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 states this, that God wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Before we can know God's will is we have to know God. There is no shortcut. Friends, you know this, this book that I'm holding here is not just a collection of stories. You know that? It's not just a book of good advice. It's not just a book on how to live a good life. No. Nope. This book is authored by God to tell us how to know God because we are loved by God. Abraham had a personal relationship with God. If we look at chapter 12, it states that he obeyed God. He worshiped God. He spent time in prayers. He called out to God. He had a personal relationship with God. And I want you to know this. What did God think of Abraham? In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, one of the most beautiful passages that talks about what God thinks of Abraham says this. But you, Israel... My servant Jacob. So he's talking to Abraham's grandson. My servant Jacob, Jacob, who I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend. Here's the Almighty God talking to Jacob, Abraham's grandson. He said, Jacob, I have chosen you. You're the descendant of Abraham. And I can imagine God just with a tear in his eye. He says, 
Abraham, my friend. Amen. God called Abraham his friend. So go back to the beginning of this sermon. What would I tell that 16-year-old boy asking God if he should join the military? I would first remind him that God is good. Then I would tell him this. Live for God. Obey the scriptures. Think of others before yourself. Love Jesus. And Brad, as you do these things, you actually have a lot of freedom to make other choices. And in the midst of that, you'll still be doing God's will. Amen. What about you? Where are you in your relationship with God? Right now, are you consumed with a struggle because of maybe lack of clarity? Or maybe because of your circumstances? Have you put God in the rear of your mirror? And you're on your own path. And you say, Brad, I'm here at church today, but you're talking about walking with God. You're talking about this journey, and I'm not interested in that. Maybe you're struggling because you're trying to do it all on your own. Maybe you prefer to have your own vision for your life. And then later you'll check with God and see if those plans work out. Or maybe you're here and you think, Brad, I've already blew it. I've already messed this up. That's you, can I tell you, friend? You don't have enough power to do that. My God says that he makes all things new. Amen. That includes your life. I can tell you that God's plan for your life, his will for your life, is much better than anything else that you've had planned. Remember what I said in the beginning of service. Our good God has a good plan for your life. Amen. If you're willing to trust and obey. Brother Gary. Brother Stan, Larry, you come and lead us in invitation. God spoken to your heart this morning. You need to make a change, and you come while we sing this prayer. <laughs>
so much for being here uh, with us today. It's so good to have all of our visitors. And uh, if you don't have a church home, we invite you to come back and be with us every time you get the opportunity. Today we are feeding lunch. So if you're visiting with us, we want to invite you to stay. And uh, we've got plenty back there, so please stay and, and fellowship with us. And uh, we've got, uh, let's see, one birthday today. Uh, Miss Karen Nick is having a birthday, and it looks like her sister's gone to get her so we can sing to her. Uh, anybody else have a birthday or an anniversary today that we don't know about? Y'all's anniversary was yesterday. All right, well, then we'll get y'all. In fact, while they go get Kara, let's go ahead and get this big. Yes? Corey had a birthday last week. Okay. Did we miss you last week, Corey? We did, didn't we? All right. Well, let's sing Donna and Jean. They have a happy anniversary. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Brother Gene, how many years? 62 years. 62. And that's right, Miss Don? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right. Well, Kara, come here. We'll sing you happy birthday. <laughs> Are you fixing to have a birthday this week? What day? Let's see. The 28th. <laughs> Come here. We're, you want us to sing you happy birthday? <laughs> Corey had a birthday last week, too, so we're going to sing it to him, too, okay? All right. Let's sing her happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. You gonna be? You gonna be ten? How old? Oh, you gonna be five? <laughs> wow, you're getting to be such a big girl, aren't you? <laughs> All right. Well, hope you'll stay and have lunch with us, Brad. So good to have you today. And I know you came back home today. So, uh, Brad actually grew up uh, just right down the street here. So, and uh, this was his home church for many, many years. So, ah. Uh, any other announcement before we dismiss for lunch? Ah, uh, are you doing pictures back there today, man? So, all right. Uh, if you hadn't had your picture took today, there's the place back there. Go get your picture took. All right. Any other announcement? Yes. Hey, uh, I wasn't here for my birthday last week, and I'm closer every day for it. I was 38. 38. Well, happy birthday, Corey. Seeing how she called me out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, after we eat lunch today, just go home and enjoy the afternoon. No evening service. So good to have all of you with us today. Let's bow our heads as we dismiss. Let me sacrifices, Lord, the, the lives that have been given through history, Lord God, for this great country of ours. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, be glorified and honored with all that's said and done here today, Lord, bless these efforts. Lord, I thank you for Brother Brad, Lord God, and what he means to this church and community, Lord God, for his service. Lord, yes. for his family, Lord, I pray that you would just continually bless him greatly, Lord, and his yes. family. Lord, and I pray that you would just be with all those, Lord, who are in the, in the line of action that are on the front lines, Lord, those that are behind desks and out in the field, Lord, whatever capacity they may be serving, Lord, I pray that you would protect them and theirs. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, be glorified and honored once again. Lord, I pray that you would bless the food and drink that we're about to partake in and pray that you would receive all the glory, honor, and glory.